Well, welcome to Georgia's Old Governor's Mansion. Uh, my name is Ashley and I'll be taking you on a tour today. So the mansion was completed in 1839. This does actually contradict our date above our front door, which is 1838. This is simply because it took them one year longer to complete the mansion, so there is a small discrepancy there. But between the years of 1839 and 1868, nine governors of Georgia served. However, only eight actually resided in the mansion. Elizabeth Brown was pregnant towards the end of Governor Brown's term, and so Governor Johnson, who was about to come in, actually allowed the Brown family to remain here at the mansion. And so only eight governors actually resided here during those years. Now, before the mansion was erected, the governor, his family, and the enslaved who did live and work here did live on the property. If you're facing the front of the mansion on the far right side of the property, you'll notice some steps that kind of lead nowhere. They do serve a purpose though. Those are the original steps to the government house, which was once here on the property. This was a two-story building um, that is where the governor and first lady stayed. But the state felt that the governor needed a more elaborate home, which is why the mansion was built. Now besides the mansion, there were other structures here on the property. Through this window here, you're seeing our education building, uh, which stands on the original foundation of Carriage House. The Carriage House uh, once stood there, and so carriages would come up from the road and then circle in to the house there. And then through this window, you're seeing Ennis Hall of Georgia College, in this back corner, which we can clearly see, is where the slaves' quarters once stood. We don't have any records about the slaves' quarters, but we do have some etchings that prove that that is where it was located. So the mansion itself is three floors. We are standing on the ground floor currently. And the mansion itself is made entirely out of brick. These bricks were handmade by the slaves who lived and worked here. And then just a layer of stucco was covered over them with the lines drawn in to give it that Greek temple vibe. And it was actually head architect Charles Kleski who designed the mansion in a Greek revival style. And he worked with head contractor Timothy Porter, a team of Irishmen from the north, and then the enslaved to build the mansion. And so here, the ground floor was primarily a private floor. There are only two public spaces, which we will see later on. But here in the workroom, which we are standing in, the enslaved would do a multitude of tasks from dishwashing and laundry. And then our lighting station is also down here. And the enslaved were responsible for hand making the candles, which would be burned here every day. And they would also have to make sure that no wax was dripping on anything. And then they were also responsible for tending to the oil lamps that were on the main floor of the mansion as well as the two public rooms on the ground floor. The oil lamps in particular were sperm whale oil. And then on the ground floor here, they actually burned animal fat candles, whereas on the third floor they used beeswax candles, which of course did burn cleaner. So this here is our servant's stairwell. Now despite its name, it was used by the enslaved. And so this stairwell actually goes directly up to the third floor of the mansion. It bypasses the main floor completely. And this allowed for the enslaved to move about the house when visitors were here without being seen by the visitors. Now they would use the main stairwell, um, but as I mentioned, if visitors were here, they would primarily use this stairwell. And it is original, and so this spiral staircase, all the steps are original to the home. And then our very large cake here. I like to consider this or think of it as a wedding cake, if you will. Uh, similar in the sense that it was made to feed a lot of people. Desserts such as these would be made for levies, the grand social parties that were held here. And so they would be feeding hundreds of guests who would be attending. And so you would need a lot of food for a lot of people. We do know that it was common for governors to hire outside confectioners uh, to help their enslaved cook uh, make food for these levies. We do know that Governor Cobb actually hired an outside confectioner, Mr. Freeman a freed black man at the time to make this style of cake in particular for one of his levies. So now we're in the indoor kitchen or the carb factory as we like to call it here. And this is because this is where your pies and breads and cakes would be made. But then this is also where your state dinners would have been plated before being served. Now there was an outdoor kitchen. However, this structure was wood and so it, has, it did burn down three times. So we don't have many records of the outdoor kitchen. But here in the indoor kitchen, 
um, around this warming cabinet here, we have the original hearth of the mansion. So this here is the original hearth of the mansion. This entire structure, as well as these bricks, are original. Additionally, these two cooking and irons were owned by Governor Cobb. Now, the hearth was discovered in the 1970s when the mansion was actually used as residency by the president of what is now Georgia College. And so the president in the 1970s wanted to convert this room into a TV room of sorts. And there was a wall that once stood here. And so he said, tear the wall down. And then the hearth was discovered. So with the wall being up, it did help preserve the hearth and the bricks as well. We do believe that Governor Brown's enslaved cook, Celia, was so skilled at baking that she'd be able to place her hand right outside of the beehive oven here and tell how hot it was and if her baked goods were done or not. Additionally, there would be a warming cabinet that would be placed directly in front of the hearth. It would be lined as tin, such as this one. And so your baked goods would be stored here um, to keep warm until being ready to be served. So we are now standing in st the steward's bedroom. Now, typically for the time period, the steward would have been a paid white male employee. However, none of the governors wanted to pay for this position out of pocket. And so they actually gave the title and responsibilities to an older gentleman of their enslaved staff. So he was the only enslaved individual to actually live directly inside the mansion. All of the others would um, reside in the slave's quarters. But this by no means made him a boss of any sort. The reason why he stayed inside the mansion is because his primary responsibility was the oversight of the mansion and all of its possessions within. So the steward was supposed to know who was supposed to be here, who was not, and then also keep track of the possessions and realize if anything was missing or not. Another responsibility of his would be to hunt and fish for the governor. And so when leaving the property, it was very important for him to wear a specific uniform. Uh, the uniform consisted of a denim jacket and then um, a white pant as well. And this uniform depicted to community members that he was in fact the governor's steward and he was allowed to carry around a rifle and or ax, which of course this was illegal for him at the time. Additionally, here on this uh, table is an original set of keys. Uh, now my dosing keys are actually based off of them. The larger one goes to all the exterior doors and then the smaller one goes to all the interior doors. But luckily I just have to carry around the two and not that giant set. So now we're in the storeroom or the larder as the 19th century term goes. And only the first lady and steward had key access to this room. And this is because along with their non-perishable food items, their valuables would be stored here as well, such as their silver, china, tobacco, and alcohol. But actually, when Governor Brown served, no tobacco or alcohol was allowed on the property due to him being a strict Baptist. Governor Brown was also our longest serving governor. Typically, a governor would serve two years, such as Howell Cobb, who served between 1851 to 1853. But Governor Brown actually served from 1857 until 1865. So no alcohol or tobacco was allowed on the property between those years. So here in this middle cabinet, we have some original sets. On this top shelf, these were owned by Governor Cobb. And then the middle and bottom shelves were owned by Governor Brown. And if you were to look closely, you would actually see some cracks running through some of the pieces. And that's because some of these were found during the archeological digs during the restoration. Now the restoration took place between 2001 and 2005. It was a nine and a half million dollar restoration to restore the mansion and the grounds back to 1851. And we do have another hidden surprise behind a door here in the storeroom. So this here is cold storage. Of course, no refrigerators in the mid 19th century. So wealthy families would typically have cold storage such as this. Now typically a solid steel door would have covered the doorway. We just have the wood slate so you can see inside. But ice would have been brought down from the north and placed inside to keep their meats and ice creams frozen for as long as possible. And if you were to go inside and uh, kind of step underneath of that archway there, you would be able to fully stand up and walk from either side because this does take up the entire space underneath of the front portico steps. So we are now in the state dining room. This is the only public room here on the ground floor. 
And having a public room on the ground floor for the time period is actually fairly uncommon, but Charles Kluski and Timothy Porter decided to add this additional entertaining space, which is why it's here on the ground floor. Now, state dinners would have been served buffet style, which is why the tables are aligned in this manner. And then the chairs would have been placed along the perimeter of the room as they are now. And this was to accommodate for the number of guests that we'd be attending. And so guests would have to sit and have their plates in their laps, or they would stand and eat, kind of like a gala dinner, if you will. And then also having the room laid out in this manner um, made it easier for women to walk around. Of course, women back then were wearing these large dresses, large hoop skirts that extended three to five feet sometimes. So having this open space was definitely a benefit. But the two warming ovens that you see are not original, however their placements are. The one closest to us has this bowl on top of it, which was actually used for potpourri or oils to be placed in it. And this helped with the smell of the room. Of course, having a bunch of food mixed with hundreds of people necessarily wasn't the best smell, so that helped. And also the appearance of the room is quite different than the other rooms we've seen here on the ground floor. We now have a decorative carpet and curtains. Additionally, we would have switched from the animal fat candles to the oil lamps here in this room. And also here in this space, I like to point out that all of our windows are original, as well as our doors. So all of our doors are made of pine. However, they are painted to look like mahogany, which is of course a more expensive type of wood. This door here is painted on both sides because both sides face public rooms and areas of the ground floor. Whereas the door that we came through, as well as the door further down that way, um, is painted only on one side to look like mahogany, which is the public facing side. The other side, which really only the enslaved would have seen, was just painted a drab color. And this is because, of course, they did not care what the enslaved saw. Now, as we head up to the main floor, if you'll notice our steps of our stairwell, they look a little warped. And this is because the entire staircase and banister are original to the mansion. So to my right, we have the elevator. Now, our elevator was actually installed in the 1960s when the president of what is now Georgia College, he was living here as well as his family. And one of his sons actually used a wheelchair and so the elevator was installed. Now, this did destroy a little bit of history here at the mansion, but it does make us ADA compatible. And so it does still operate and it actually runs directly up through our attic. And so lucky for us, it's still in operation until today. So now we're up on the main floor, particularly in the ladies' parlor, which served as the formal meeting space where the first lady would meet with female community members to discuss a variety of matters. So an enslaved individual would actually bring hot water and loose leaf tea up here and set the table for the meeting. However, the first lady would serve the tea herself. Meetings were roughly 15 minutes long, uh, concise to the point. And here above the mantel, we have Mary Ann Lamar Cobb. She was actually born and raised here in Milledgeville to a very wealthy family. She herself becoming a cotton heiress. And so when she married Howell Cobb, Cobb was actually spending her inheritance money and he was spending it to such a degree that her brother actually had to put Governor Cobb on an allowance. Of course, back then women did not control their own money, so her brother had to step in to deal with the matter. And then here we have Elizabeth Grisham Brown, first lady of the Civil War, as we like to call her here. She was in fact married to Governor Joseph Brown, which is pictured below her. And she was a very active first lady. She is the only first lady of Georgia to have a statue alongside her husband's up in Atlanta. And she even served as her husband's clerk for a short period of time when Governor Brown's own clerk had to head off to war. Now here on the center table, this large silver spoon up front, this was owned by Mary Ann. Additionally, in this back corner, the table, the writing table with the closed book on top of it, was also owned by Mary Ann. Some other original pieces here in this space, the open piano book there in the back corner. Uh, this was owned by Sarah Crawford, one of the daughters of Governor Crawford, 
And she even wrote in this piano book above the girl figure, Anna, and then above the male figure, Pa, to represent her father and her sister. And then this piano here was owned by Governor Towns, and it was made during the transition from the harpsichord to the modern day piano, which is why the full set of keys is not here on this piano. And the painted shades here in this space were actually hand painted by an artist who came in during the restoration. And these are French courting scenes taken from the Godey's Ladies magazine, which is this open magazine here on the smaller table. Kind of the Southern living of the time, if you will. And the painted shades do coincide with the courting couch, which is placed in front of our fireplace. Back then, if a man and woman were unmarried, it was frowned upon for them to physically touch. So a man would sit on one side of the couch and a woman would sit on the other. Additionally, hanging above the piano, these images here are from the series, The Cries of London, and they depict the slums in England. And then the four nature scenes above them are copies of Audubon's nature scenes. And if you'll notice how these images are hung, as well as the portraits, this is how uh, images back then and portraits were hung on the wall back in the day, so with the tassels. Of course, today we have them a little more secure to the wall. Additionally, uh, the paint color of this room is a light purple. And during the restoration, we were able to chip through the years, if you will, and collect paint samples from the year. And so we matched the wall colors to the exact color that would have been here in each room in 1851. So now we are in the foyer, which is the first room that guests would have entered into when coming to the mansion. This here is the front door. And so because this is the first room that guests would have seen, the style of this room uh, definitely depicts a sense of patriotism because this is to remind guests that although this is a residency, it is still the executive mansion of Georgia and a government building. So we have the declaration hanging in the gold frame, George Washington, and then also our state and national flags, the national sporting 31 stars. Now when guests would arrive, they would bring and present a calling card, which is kind of the predecessor to phone calls and texting, if you will. Um, it would include their name, why they were here, who they were wanting to see, things of that sort. And then when a messenger boy would both live and work here when the state legislature was in session, he would sit at his messenger station and greet guests coming in and then take the calling cards to either the governor or first lady. And the floor has an interesting story as well. So this here is a piece of the original floor cloth that was found up in the attic. The larger piece does hang in our education building. And so during the restoration, we brought four artists from Pennsylvania down to hand paint the floor we're standing on. The four artists made a stencil from the piece and they hand painted the floor we're standing on. The stencil really just contains the large geometric patterns, all of the individual floral patterns and then the little circles were individually done. And so they laid down a wood base and then nailed the floor cloth into the original nail holes that were found and then covered the floor with 15 layers of shellac. And so the four artists painted this floor and then the floor of the rotunda, which we'll see later on. And it took them only 72 hours to complete both rooms. We are now in the Grand Salon, which served as the primary entertaining space here at the mansion. So when guests would arrive for the levees, guests would be entered primarily into this room. The tables and chairs would have been removed to accommodate for the number of guests, as well as allow dancing that would have been done here in this room as well. Now, if you'll notice, we have peacock and pheasant feathers present in this space, and that's because peacock feathers represent femininity, whereas pheasant feathers represent masculinity. So having them both present in this space symbolizes that it is acceptable for men and women to gather here. And if you'll remember back in the ladies' parlor, only peacock feathers were present. So the carpet of this room also has an interesting story. If you'll notice the lines running through it, that's because we had it installed the same way it was done back in the day. So it would have been brought in in these individual strips and then hand sewn together. And back then it would have been a duty of the enslaved to hand clean this entire carpet. So the enslaved would have to tear up each individual strip hand clean it, and then sew it all back together. 
We were able to reach out to the company who manufactured the original carpet, and they provided us a copy of the record of the carpet they originally installed. And so this exact color scheme and pattern is what was here in the Grand Salon in 1851. Now these two red couches here were owned by Governor Lumpkin and used in Government House. And these two red rocking chairs were owned by Governor Brown and have been passed down through the Brown family. Additionally, the two black marble fireplaces you see are original to the house. They were hand carved in Italy, shipped across the Atlantic to Georgia, and then sailed up the river here specifically for the executive mansion. Now the portraits you see here in this space. On the far wall, we have Governor Howell Cobb. As I mentioned, he did like spending money, and so he spent quite a deal of time here entertaining in this space. Then, the dark portrait there is an original, and it is of Governor Herschel Vespasian Johnson. He was very involved in the Compromise of 1850, and he did believe in women's education. But do take that with a grain of salt. He only supported women's education because he believed it made them better wives and mothers. To the left of Governor Johnson, we have Governor George Crawford, father of Sarah Crawford, whose music book we saw back in the parlor. And he was George's only Whig governor, Whig being the predecessor to the modern day Republican Party. And then on the wall here closest to us, we have Governor, governor Thomas Ruger. Ruger was actually appointed, not elected as governor. And this was in fact after the Civil War. And you might be able to tell by his attire that he was in fact a Union General before being appointed. But despite these two things, he was actually extremely well liked by the community. When he moved to Atlanta in 1868, when the capital of Georgia moved from Milledgeville to Atlanta in this year, the community actually threw him a farewell parade. And so he was the last governor to actually reside here at the mansion, and he served from January to June of 1868. So now we're in the family dining room, which is where the governor and first lady would have their day-to-day -day meals. And also if the governor was, you know, having a meal with some close colleagues, they would also eat here in the dining room. Now the dining room table you see is actually, uh, or was owned by Governor Cobb. We do have all 12 leaves extended, however they can be removed to shorten the table. Additionally, these two silver candlesticks, as well as this turkey platter in the center, were also owned by Governor Cobb. And Governor Cobb does look down on these from the wall there. This is an original portrait and matches the one of his wife, Mary Ann, which we saw back in the parlor. And both of these are on loan to us by the Cobb family, who we are still in contact with today. Now the screen to my left here represents the butler's pantry, which once stood here in this very corner. Currently our elevator shaft runs through it, but this is where the pantry once stood. And similar to the servant stairwell, despite its name, it was used by the enslaved here. The steward would have served as the butler, so he would have served the family during mealtime. However, if he was not needed at that exact moment, he would then have to await inside the pantry. So this continues the theme we've seen here of keeping the enslaved out of sight, out of mind, and less needed. Now, Below the portrait of Governor Cobb, this red uh, couch here actually doubles as a hideaway bed. You'd be able to pull out the bottom completely and it would fully extend. It is also owned or was owned by Governor Brown. And this is one of the pieces of furniture that Governor Brown had removed from the mansion when the Union Army came here to Milledgeville. Now, after burning Atlanta, the Union Army was making their way here. Governor Brown was made aware of this. And so most of the furnishings were packed up and sent to Montezuma, Georgia, along with his family, whereas Governor Brown himself went to Macon, Georgia. So when the Union Army arrived, uh, they did use the mansion as residency. And actually we have a small image of General Sherman to coincide with this story, because General Sherman actually spent his one day and one night here in the mansion in this very room. He slept here in this room and planned out the rest of the march to the sea with his other generals. Now, besides, of course, destroying the armory and also holding a mock funeral for Governor Brown, not much damage was done to the mansion or the town. Milledgeville is kind of a rest and resource stop for the army. And so it was actually after the army left that Milledgeville locals came and looted the mansion and they were going through the rest of the furnishings that were left behind. 
Governor Brown was of course not pleased when he returned and found out that this had happened. Now the other portraits here in this space, above the cellaret, we have Governor Jenkins. And then above the sideboard, we have Governor George Washington Bonaparte Towns. He did in fact remove Bonaparte from his name once entering politics. He did not pe want people to associate him with Napoleon. And he's also the owner of the piano that we saw back in the parlor. So now we're in the governor's office. This was his private home office, although he did have a secondary one located in the state capitol building across town. It currently houses the Georgia Military College, and so you can go visit it today. And so over at the state capitol building, he had his secondary office. But here, he would share this office space with his clerk or secretary. These terms are interchangeable. And the clerk would help assist him in his day-to-day -day tasks and lived and worked here when the legislature was in session. On this 1847 map of Georgia here above the bookshelf, the image on the right side actually depicts the state capitol building. And then the image on the left side of the map is actually the earliest known image of the executive mansion. And the desk you see behind me is actually Governor Brown's original desk. Now, given that he was governor during the Civil War, any documents pertaining to Georgia's role and involvement in the Civil War did pass across this very desk. Additionally, this red cushioned chair here was also owned by Governor Brown, and it does recline and still reclines to this day. And the bust you see behind the chair is actually of Governor Brown himself. You might notice that part of his nose is missing, which is why we like to refer to it as the Brown Sphinx here at the mansion. And that's because some children in the Brown family thought it would be fun to roll it down a hill. And so that's why part of his nose is missing. Additionally, uh, to the left of the secretary, we have an image of President Buchanan's cabinet. We have it here because the man on the far left is Howell Cobb. Cobb did aspire to become president, although this never happened. After serving as governor, he did serve as secretary of the treasury under Buchanan. Now we're in the rotunda, which is the heart of the executive mansion. And this served as a waiting room, if you will, when visitors were coming to the mansion, particularly male visitors who are wishing to see the governor, whose office is to my right here. And this room is also where the governor and first lady would greet guests who were coming to attend their levees. Now it is 50 feet from the floor we're standing on to the gold medallion there at the very top of the dome. The dome is encased in our attic, so it is completely invisible from the outside. You can only see the cupola windows there at the top. And this was purposefully designed by Charles Kluski to serve as a wow factor for guests entering into the mansion. And of course, no AC in the mid-19th century, so the cupola windows at the top would be opened. They would send a member of their enslaved staff to the rooftop via the attic to open said windows. And then they would open all of these doors to create a cross breeze throughout the entire mansion. Looking up at the rotunda's balcony, you're seeing doors which lead to the bedrooms, as well as a linen closet and hallway on the third floor. Additionally, the floor we're standing on does continue uh, from the foyer. So the four artists painted both rooms and it took them only 72 hours to complete both rooms. So we are now on the third floor of the mansion, which is where all of the bedrooms are. There are seven in total. However, today we only interpret and show three. The nursery and the master bedroom we will head into later. But now we are currently standing in the clerk and messenger's bedroom. I mentioned both of these individuals a little earlier, but as I said, during the, when the legislature was in session, the clerk and messenger lived and worked here. So they had a bedroom here on the third floor because they were paid white males. The messenger would have been 15 to 16 years of age. So he would have had the smaller bed. And then the clerk would have been 20 to 24 years of age, thus having the larger bed and either already in law school or heading into law school. So they shared this room together. And this table to my left is actually quite unique. It is made of tiger maple wood, which is now an extinct type of wood. Additionally, this bed here was owned by Governor Johnson and an enslaved male on his home plantation did carve these banana leaves into the post there. And then also here in this back corner, 
This is Governor Brown's secretary. We have it up here um, as opposed to down in, his, in the governor's office. Uh, the one currently in the office just goes better with the Gothic architecture and style of the other pieces of furniture. And in the window pane of the window to the right of the secretary, there's some engravings that we believe were done by diamond rings worn by students who lived here when the mansion served as a dormitory for Georgia Normal and Industrial College, which then turned to Georgia State College for Women, and of course is now Georgia College. So the engraving on the left reads March 15th, 1911. The one in the middle reads three weeks till Christmas. And then the one on the right we reads I love M. Kendrick. So we're now standing in the master bedroom, which is of course where the governor and first lady would come together every night to discuss matters they attended to and who they met with throughout the day. And if you'll notice the wall color it is a light pink color. And this was requested by the governors because back then, pink was seen as a masculine color. So it was requested by the governors that their master bedroom be painted such. Now we do have an abundance of original objects here in this room. The bed you see was in fact owned by Governor Lumpkin. And here on the bed, there is this quilt, which was made by Elizabeth Brown and the Brown's daughter, Mary Virginia. Additionally, the desk chair in front of it, and then the chest of drawers there in the corner. These three pieces were owned by Governor Brown. Additionally, the traveling shaving kit there on top of the chest of drawers was owned by Governor Cobb. And here in the corner to the left of the bed, this apothecary set was also owned by Governor Cobb. And all the bottles and labels are original and some still contain medicine in them today. Now, when the Union Army came here, to remove Governor Brown from office. Supposedly he was shaving, and so we do have Governor Brown's original shaving mirror there. And so when the army busted into the mansion, he was actually halfway through shaving. And so in his robe with shaving cream on, shaving cream on his face, he did step out onto the balcony to be greeted by the Union Army. Now we're in the nursery, which is where the children here at the mansion spent most of their time. They did in fact share only one bed, of course, if they were infants, they would also keep a cradle in here as well. But children stayed here at the mansion until between the ages of 7 to 11. Then between those years, the girls would then head off to finishing school and the boys would be sent to boarding school. Now, we have two children here in this space. Here we have Andrew Jackson Cobb and then we have Mary Virginia Brown. Now, Mary Virginia actually had a bride and groom doll set. We actually have Jack Jones, which was her uh, groom doll. Sadly, we do not have his bride, Sue, with us. But as most young girls do when they have a bride and groom doll, she wanted to have them wed. But she went a little above and beyond. She invited the local Baptist minister here in Milledgeville to come to the mansion to officiate the doll wedding. Now news did spread, and so it actually turned out to be quite a party uh, in witnessing the doll wedding. And so we actually recreate this doll wedding here every spring here at the mansion. We of course have the doll wedding, and then we also have food, refreshments, and then 19th century lawn games as well. Now here on the bed, we have a reproduction nursemaid uniform, which the nursemaid would have been an enslaved woman who would have tended to the children and also seen out in public with the First Lady and children, which is why her uniform resembled the appearance of the First Lady. We do know that the Brown's nursemaid was Emma, and Emma was actually the daughter of Celia, who was their enslaved cook. And so Emma, Celia, and Emma's brother, Cornelius, all came here to the mansion and were a part of Elizabeth's dowry. And from here, you can see the servant stairwell, which the top of it comes out right about where the nursery door is.